Man, you doing it, man. You deserve it, daddy. You putting it out. Brother Love, Diddy, Sean, Combs. What is it? Diddy. We're going to simplify for everybody on this run right here. We're going to go with Diddy. And that's final. Yeah, that's final. But you could call me Love, though, too. Like so it turns out that the Lil Rod lawsuit may have more to it than we originally thought. Both Meek Mill and Young Miami have seemingly been mentioned in it. And it is shocking. I feel bad for Meek. And the reason I feel bad for I Meek is, is you know, we've never heard this uh, 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 about Meek or, or, or seen this energy about Meek. Meek, yeah. Meek is a dope rapper, but I think sometimes Meek falls victim to, I have to explain myself. Cause about this being a criminal enterprise that's all feeding towards this one individual's uh, depravity of wanting drugs and sex and rock and roll, roll and everything in between. On Wednesday, Meek Mill took to social media to address swirling accusations linking him to the latest lawsuit against Diddy. The Philly native voiced concerns about a prevailing belief within the hip-hop industry that artists are either informants or gay, though he didn't specify who they were in this context. Again, I draw the comparison to, to that of R. Kelly, where there might have been rumors in the background. There were lawsuits that were settled. There were whispers uh, behind closed doors. But as those whispers start to grow and grow and get louder... Expressing frustration, Meek asserted, They are powering this stuff even if it's fake. The goal is to disrupt the hip-hop community. I own this music that dropped Tomar Play It. Meanwhile, he hinted at a midnight release for a project titled Heathenism. We're probably looking at these allegations and thinking, where are the videos, where are these still shots that we're seeing in these complaints, and can we investigate it to see if there's more here, potentially criminal charges. And that Meek also vowed to expose those attempting to tarnish the image of influential black artists and accused every black blog site of portraying him in a misleading light. The controversy stemmed from a new sexual harassment and assault lawsuit against Diddy, where two names, including a Philadelphia rapper who dated Nicki Minaj, were redacted. With Meek fitting these criteria, speculation surrounded him, fueled by DJ academics, whom Meek confronted on social media. Clarifying his sexuality, Meek emphasized his heterosexuality while promising to identify those orchestrating campaigns against him. He declared, When I find out, we gonna take him to war for trying to stop my family wealth. Something never seen before will happen in the industry, even if I gotta risk my life for it. I'm the average move him out the way type thing. As discussions around the lawsuit continued, social media users speculated about Meek and Usher's involvement, although neither artist was accused of any crime. Diddy's lawyer promptly dismissed the allegations, labeling the accuser a liar seeking an undeserved payday. Meek's connections to Philadelphia and his past relationship with Nicki Minaj fueled the speculation, but it's crucial to note that neither Meek nor Usher is explicitly accused in the lawsuit. While Usher and Meek have not publicly addressed the speculation, Meek engaged in a social media dispute with DJ Academics over the lawsuit allegations. As the controversy unfolds, it remains essential to await further developments and official statements from the involved parties. In a startling legal development, music producer Rodney Lil Rod Jones has filed a lawsuit against Sean Diddy Combs, claiming over a year of sexual harassment and threats. Seeking $30 million in the federal lawsuit, Jones has implicated several high-profile figures, including Diddy's son, Justin Dior Combs, Universal Music Group CEO Lucian Charles Grange, and others in the entertainment industry. The 75-page complaint, filed in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York, sheds light on the alleged misconduct. Jones, a Chicago-born producer responsible for nine songs on Diddy's 2023 album, The Love Album Off the Grid, asserts that his life has been severely impacted since agreeing to produce the album in August 2022. According to Jones's attorney, Tyrone A. Blackburn, the producer lived with Diddy for extended periods in various locations, including Los Angeles, New York City, Miami, and on a yacht in the U.S. Virgin Islands. The complaint details that Jones, under an implied work-for-hire agreement, was required to constantly record Diddy. In a particularly serious claim, Jones, describing himself as a heterosexual Christian man, alleges constant unsolicited and unauthorized groping and touching of his anus by Diddy. Uncomfortable with these advances, Jones reportedly expressed his concerns to Diddy's chief of staff, 
Christina K.K. Corum, who allegedly responded with, you know, Sean will be Sean. The lawsuit contends that the network of individuals involved in the alleged misconduct amounts to a violation of the Racketeer Influenced and Corrupt Organizations Act, RICO. Comparing Corum to Ghislaine Maxwell in Jeffrey Epstein's case, Blackburn suggests a parallel between the two situations. This legal battle is a significant development in the ongoing challenges surrounding Diddy, and it will undoubtedly attract attention as it unfolds. In a shocking lawsuit filed by producer Rodney Lil Rod Jones against Sean Diddy Combs, a myriad of allegations has come to light. Jones claims that over more than a year, he faced sexual harassment and threats from the media mogul. Seeking $30 million in damages, Jones implicated high-profile figures in the entertainment industry, including Diddy's son, Justin Dior Combs, Universal Music Group CEO Lucian Charles Grange, and others. The complaint, filed in the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York, spans 75 pages, revealing a complex web of accusations. Jones, who produced nine songs on Diddy's 2023 The Love Album Off the Grid, alleges that his life took a detrimental turn since agreeing to produce the album in August 2022. Living with Diddy for extended periods in Los Angeles, New York City, and Miami, as well as on a yacht in the U.S. Virgin Islands, Jones claims to have witnessed disturbing behavior beyond his role as a producer. The complaint states that Diddy required Jones to record him constantly, and the producer alleges unsolicited and unauthorized groping and touching by Diddy. Moreover, Jones accuses Diddy of attempting to groom him into engaging in sexual activities with producer Stevie J and making promises related to winning a Grammy. The complaint suggests that Diddy possesses compromising footage obtained through hidden cameras at his properties, making him feel above the law. Jones goes on to claim that he was sexually assaulted by a cousin or assistant of rapper Young Miami, sexually harassed and assaulted by Cuba Gooding Jr., and obtained footage of unnamed individuals consorting with underage girls and sex workers. He asserts having secured hours of footage and audio recordings of illegal activities involving Diddy, his staff, and guests. The producer claims to have irrefutable evidence of Diddy providing laced alcoholic beverages to minors and sex workers, as well as the distribution and use of various illegal substances and unregistered firearms. Jones disclosed that he found himself in the midst of a shooting at Chalice Recording Studios in Los Angeles on September 12, 2022. According to Jones, Combs gave him strict instructions to mislead the police about Combs' involvement in the incident. Jones claims he was coerced into falsely stating that a friend named G was shot in a drive-by outside the studio. G is identified as a 30-year-old friend of Justin Combs, Diddy's son. Jones asserted that he still possesses the blood-stained clothing worn that day while assisting the victim. He provided screenshots depicting the aftermath of the restroom, suggesting it was the location where G was shot, allegedly by either Mr. Combs or J. Combs. Accusing Combs' chief of staff, Corum, Jones claimed she instructed her staff to retrieve drugs for Combs' consumption. The footage he possesses also allegedly shows Christian Combs, Diddy's son, drugging and sexually assaulting a woman. Furthermore, Jones accused Combs of discussing plans to use his relationship with Bishop T.D. Jakes to mitigate the impact on his public image following a lawsuit by Cassie Ventura. This lawsuit, involving rape and abuse and settled in November, marked the beginning of Diddy's recent challenges, including additional sexual assault allegations and his resignation as chairman of Revolt TV. In his legal action, Jones not only accused Combs but also implicated love records, Motown and UMG, alleging they were unjustly enriched at his expense. This comes after Jones had previously made a public plea on social media for Combs to compensate him for his work on the album, adding another layer to the unfolding legal saga. In a statement to the Times on Tuesday, Combs' attorney, Sean Hawley, strongly refuted Jones's claims, labeling him as a liar and accusing him of seeking an undeserved payday. Hawley dismissed Jones's account as reckless name-dropping and described the events mentioned as pure fiction that simply did not occur. 
The attorney characterized Jones's actions as a transparent attempt to grab headlines, emphasizing that there is overwhelming and indisputable evidence proving the claims to be false. Despite the availability of substantial proof, Holly noted that attempts to communicate with Jones's attorney, Tyrone Blackburn, have been met with silence, as Blackburn has allegedly ignored their calls. Holly affirmed that they are prepared to address these outlandish allegations in court and take appropriate action against those making them. Meanwhile, in November 2023, singer Cassie, whose real name is Cassandra Ventura, made headlines when she filed a federal lawsuit against her former partner, Sean Diddy Combs. The lawsuit was nothing short of explosive, detailing allegations of physical and sexual abuse throughout their relationship. Cassie claimed that Combs subjected her to a range of abuse, from physical violence and coercing her into intimate acts with others, to a disturbing incident of rape at her home in 2018. Surprisingly, the rapper settled the lawsuit within a day. However, this was just the beginning, as three more women and one man have since come forward with lawsuits against Combs. The accusations cover a spectrum of abusive behaviors, including sexual harassment, rape, non-consensual pornography, and sex trafficking. In response, Combs vehemently denied all the allegations, asserting that his accusers are attempting to tarnish his character, destroy his reputation, and undermine his legacy. Cassie's legal action was framed within the context of a pattern of abuse, violence, and sex trafficking. She invoked New York's Adult Survivors Act, which offered victims a one-year window to sue their alleged abusers, even if the statute of limitations had expired. This window closed in November. Cassie revealed that she first encountered Combs in 2005 when she was 19, and he was 37. The lawsuit painted a picture of Combs exerting control over nearly every aspect of her life, from her career to accessing her medical records. She alleged frequent physical abuse, claiming Combs would violently attack her multiple times a year while also providing her with substantial amounts of drugs. The lawsuit took a darker turn as Cassie asserted that Combs compelled her to engage in intimate acts with male sex workers in various cities. She claimed he watched, masturbated to, and recorded these encounters. Cassie admitted to not reporting these incidents to the police out of fear that it would provide Combs with another excuse to harm her. A particularly distressing incident in 2018 involved Combs forcing his way into her apartment and raping her, despite her repeated objections. Following this traumatic event, Cassie stated that she decisively ended the relationship. In her lawsuit, Cassie cited several witnesses who had observed the alleged abuse. One notable witness is her friend, singer-songwriter Tiffany Redd, who penned an open letter to Sean Diddy Combs, recounting an incident from Ventura's 29th birthday party in 2015. According to Ventura and Redd, that night, Combs, along with his security team, allegedly compelled Ventura to leave because he desired her to engage in intimate encounters with other men. Redd disclosed that Ventura had shared with her at the time about Combs being physically abusive. In her letter, Red affirmed that everything Cassie described in her complaint about that night aligns with her own experiences. Combs' lawyer, Benjamin Braffman, responded to the New York Times, vehemently denying the allegations and characterizing the lawsuit as riddled with baseless and outrageous lies aimed at damaging Combs' reputation and seeking financial gain. The lawsuit was settled just one day after being filed, and the specific details of the settlement remain confidential. Braffman emphasized that the resolution should not be construed as an admission of wrongdoing on Combs' part. Cassie, in a statement, expressed her decision to resolve the matter amicably, citing a level of control over the terms. She extended gratitude to her family, fans, and legal team for their unwavering support. Combs, too, acknowledged the amicable resolution, wishing Cassie and her family all the best. In the wake of the settlement, Liza Gardner filed a lawsuit on November 23rd, just before the Adult Survivors Act expired. Gardner recounts an incident dating back to 1990 or 1991, when she and a friend met Diddy and singer-songwriter Aaron Hall at an MCA Records event. Afterward, they went to Hall's apartment for an after-party, where Gardner claims she was coerced into having sex with Diddy. She asserts that Diddy also assaulted her friend. 
Gardner describes the encounter as leaving her shocked and traumatized. Additionally, she alleges that Hall later forced her into sex at her home. A few days later, Diddy allegedly attacked her again at the house, concerned that her friend might disclose the incident to someone he was with at the time. Joy Dickerson Neal, in another complaint filed on the same day, recounts a date with Diddy in 1991. She claims Diddy intentionally drugged and sexually assaulted her after dinner, recording the assault and showing the tape to others. Dickerson Neal did not immediately report the incident to authorities, but eventually filed a police report in New York and New Jersey. She believes potential witnesses were afraid of retaliation from Diddy, fearing they would lose future business and music opportunities if they supported her account. Diddy's spokesperson dismissed the claims of Gardner and Dickerson Neal as fabricated and accused them of exploiting the Adult Survivors Act. In a separate lawsuit filed on December 6th, an unnamed woman referred to as Jane Doe alleges that in 2003, when she was 17, Diddy, his longtime associate Harve Pierre, and an unidentified third person gang-raped her at Diddy's Manhattan recording studio. The lawsuit suggests that the men trafficked Doe across state lines, drugged her, and violently assaulted her while she protested. Diddy has strongly refuted all the allegations made against him, expressing frustration at what he perceives as character assassination. In a statement, he exclaimed, Enough is enough. He spoke out against the sickening allegations that, according to him, individuals are using to seek a quick payday. Diddy asserted his innocence, stating unequivocally that he did not commit any of the alleged actions. He emphasized his commitment to fight for his name, his family, and the truth. As a response to the mounting controversies, Diddy took a temporary step back from his role as chairman of Revolt, the media company he founded in 2013. The decision aimed to ensure that Revolt remains focused on its mission, even though Diddy had no recent operational involvement in the company. Additionally, Capital Prep Harlem, a charter school he established in 2016, announced the termination of its partnership with the music mogul. In the wake of the allegations, a new reality show featuring Diddy in the early stages of development at Hulu has been scrapped, as reported by Variety. The show, tentatively titled Diddy Plus Seven, which would have followed Diddy and his family, has been halted due to the ongoing controversy surrounding the rapper. Former bad boy rapper Mark Curry, who authored the 2009 expose on Sean Diddy Combs, titled Dancing with the Devil, recently shared some intriguing insights on the Art of Dialogue YouTube channel. While Curry's book, accusing Combs of being an exploitative businessman, flew under the radar in the past, recent legal challenges against Combs have brought it back into the spotlight. In clips uploaded on YouTube, Curry alleges that Combs was involved in a physical altercation with his ex-girlfriend Kim Porter on a yacht, resulting in her broken nose. He also claims that Combs once threw a chair at a producer after overhearing a conversation with Porter on a tapped phone line. Shockingly, Curry asserts that he witnessed Diddy spiking women's drinks in the club, a disturbing accusation, especially given Curry's implication that he continued to socialize with Combs despite witnessing such behavior. Curry now joins the ranks of Diddy's former bodyguards, Gene Deal and Roger Bonds, who have spoken out about their experiences with Combs following the lawsuits. While these accounts may further tarnish Diddy's reputation, they also raise questions about why individuals like Curry remained associated with him after the initial allegations. This isn't the first time that shots have been taken at Combs' character. In 2019, former bad boy artist Mace criticized Combs for alleged unethical business practices. Other accusations about Combs' character extend beyond the boardroom, with hints from his ex-girlfriend Misa Hilton and Gina Hyun about troubling behavior. The recent wave of accusations against Combs comes at a time when high-profile individuals facing allegations of sexual misconduct often rely on a network of enablers. Examples like R. Kelly and Africa Bambata illustrate how a circle of supporters can enable such behavior to persist. In the case of Diddy, individuals around him are now admitting to having known about his conduct, shedding light on the complexity of enabling in such situations. Cassie's lawsuit dropped a bombshell, claiming that Roger Bonds, once Diddy's security guard, intervened when Combs attacked her. After the lawsuit hit the headlines, 
Bonds took to Instagram, later deleting his post, where he not only confirmed Cassie's allegations, but hinted at a pattern of violence. Bonds revealed he quit as Combs' security because he couldn't stomach covering up his actions. Curiously, he briefly deactivated his Instagram, only to return days later with a subscribe button. In a now-deleted post, Bonds criticized Combs for not financially supporting his incarcerated son in Namibia and teased a mysterious two faces coming soon. He also warned followers not to speculate on Cassie and Diddy's relationship without understanding the full story. Mark Curry's book, Dancing with the Devil, skewers Diddy as an exploitative businessman who allegedly left Curry so financially strapped that he contemplated selling weed. However, Curry's recent revelations about Combs abusing and drugging women aren't found in the book. In an Art of Dialogue interview, Curry admitted to the party culture of spiking champagne and giving women pills, attributing it to the hip-hop scene's norms until the Bill Cosby scandal shed light on the issue. Perhaps Curry left out these details to avoid exposing his own complicity in Combs' questionable practices. Eugene Big Jean Deal, another former security guard for Diddy, has been consistently critical of the mogul over the years. Despite his live-streamed exposés accusing Combs of assaulting the mothers of his children, Kim Porter and Misa Hilton, Deal's prolonged association with Diddy raises eyebrows. In a recent video, Deal claimed he never witnessed Combs assaulting a woman and adamantly stated he would never permit such behavior. However, he also acknowledged hearing about Combs assaulting Hilton and asserted he knew Porter faced similar challenges, echoing Cassie's claims. Deal has hinted at an upcoming book about his time at the label, facing challenges promoting it due to entertainment platforms fearing repercussions from his former client. The question lingers. Why did he stick around long enough to accumulate so many scandalous stories about someone he seemingly despises? For more than three decades, Diddy has presented himself as a carefree, two-stepping Hamptons enthusiast. Yet there has always been a lingering sense that beneath the surface, issues with Death Row, City College, Steve Stout, and a history of exploiting artists hinted at a darker side behind his larger-than-life persona. The allure of his music kept the show going, even as claims of violence were seemingly overlooked by security guards, assistants, secretaries, close friends, and others in his orbit. Now, as former associates spill the beans online, the blogosphere, aggregation hubs, and gossip enthusiasts eagerly share clips of these revelations. However, amidst the unfolding drama, it's crucial to recognize that Diddy's empire is now under scrutiny, primarily due to brave women who have come forward about their traumatic experiences. The focus should be on their courage, not on those who turned a blind eye for years. These enablers, despite now sharing lengthy stories, are not the heroes of this narrative. The spotlight rightfully belongs to those who chose to speak up against the alleged violence and injustice they witnessed. According to recent allegations, it seems Diddy might have had some clandestine rendezvous at Turkish bathhouses with gay men about three times a week. The rumors about his relationship with the Dreams and Nightmares hitmaker have been swirling for a while, and a recent expose has only fueled the speculation further. Diddy's former bodyguard, Gene Deal, spilled a lot of details in an interview with The Art of Dialogue. Deal claims that the 54-year-old mogul pressured his ex-girlfriend into hiring male prostitutes to maintain discretion. What tipped Deal off? In response to persistent rumors about Puff Daddy's personal life, Deal said he quickly learned when to give Diddy his space during their outings. Deal cited instances where he allegedly witnessed the rapper purchasing butt plugs or heading to what seemed to be a gay hotspot. I knew I should wait outside of Turkish baths for him. You know what they do in Turkish baths? I saw this dude pick up butt plugs. This was the first time I was seeing some sh asterisk tea like that. That's where a lot of gay men meet, and they all take hot baths together. To each his own, though, right? Further delving into the speculation about Diddy's sexuality, Deal continued with more claims. That's a lot of s asterisk asterisk tea that these guys get into when they start having certain meetings with certain people, and they meet them at the Turkish baths, and they do they meetings, and they meet their people in those types of situations where they're comfortable at. So they don't have to worry about their indiscretions coming out. 
So that's why, you know, twice, sometimes three times a week, me and the driver be outside, he'll run into the Turkish bath. Three times a week? Quite the revelation. According to Deal, Diddy may have been leading a double life, engaging in secret encounters with gay men at Turkish bathhouses. In a recent turn of events, though, Diddy appears to have caught a break amidst the ongoing sexual assault lawsuits he's been facing since last year. The victory comes in the form of a successful appeal against his most recent accuser, who had been seeking to maintain anonymity in court. This accuser, previously referred to as Jane Doe, was ordered by the court to disclose her identity following Combs' insistence. According to court documents obtained by TMZ, the judge ruled that Jane Doe lacked more specific support to justify keeping her identity confidential. The case revolves around the fourth and latest lawsuit filed against the music mogul on December 6th. In this lawsuit, Jane Doe alleged that Combs, along with his longtime associate Harve Pierre and an unidentified man, gang-raped her in New York in 2003 when she was a 17-year-old high school student. Initially, Combs sought to dismiss Jane Doe's request for anonymity, while she argued that he was pushing for her identity to publicly discredit her. She claimed to be the victim of a separate set of wrongdoings that occurred almost two decades after the events central to this case. Ultimately, the court ruled in favor of Combs in this particular instance. In addressing the Lil Rod lawsuit, Meek Mill essentially refuted Jones's accusations through a series of posts on X, formerly Twitter, yesterday. In his posts, Meek asserted, No man or Watt would ever approach me about gay activity and the whole place don't get flipped. Woke up seeing this on every blog like they know I'm coming. LOL. Meek, known for his candid social media presence, found himself facing relentless fan engagement as he vehemently declared his heterosexuality. Adding to the spectacle, he engaged in arguments with DJ academics after the media personality read the lawsuit on his stream. Meek also traded X posts with Manosphere blogger Andrew Tate, an unexpected clash. The aftermath of the accusations against Meek and his subsequent response turned into a chaotic ex-dumpster fire, with quote posts and memes circulating rapidly as people tried to go viral. While such online banter is often tied to gaffes or contentious rap beef, this time, the joke stemmed from serious and traumatic accusations. Meek's online clashes with academics and Tate became headline news, overshadowing the core issue at stake, potential sexual assault, including against underage girls. In a less homophobic society, Meek's bombastic response to the allegations might not have been as amplified, and the resulting commotion might not have been as deafening. Unfortunately, this isn't the first instance, and it won't be the last, where homophobia clouds a serious reckoning with sexual assault allegations. In 2007, B2K member Raz B accused his cousin and manager Chris Stokes of sexual molestation. Rather than garnering public empathy, he became a punchline. Last year, Raz B recanted the allegations against Stokes, shifting blame to his brothers for the molestation. Days later, he climbed onto the roof of a Kansas City hospital, expressing feeling unsafe and was placed on a 72-hour psychiatric hold. It raises questions about how public derision may have impacted his mental health over the years. In a similar vein, consider the case of NBA player Dwight Howard, who faced accusations of sexual assault last year. Instead of delving into the allegations, the aftermath became fixated on speculations about his sexuality. This shift allowed him to redirect the narrative, emphasizing his sexual orientation rather than addressing the serious allegations against him. It raises important questions about our collective fascination with queerness, often overshadowing discussions about sexual assault. What does this say about our priorities and the challenges faced by those who may hesitate to come forward due to lingering stigmas against the LGBTQ community? The unfortunate consequence is that such homophobia can inadvertently protect wrongdoers who operate in the shadows. This tendency to lose focus has also manifested in the ongoing lawsuits against Sean Combs. In December, a Michigan woman filed a lawsuit claiming that Combs, then bad boy president Harve Pierre, and a third man violently assaulted her in 2003 when she was 17. Strikingly, Combs and his legal team are pushing for the woman's name to be made public. 
In response, her lawyers argued that revealing her identity could become a means to divert attention away from the serious allegations. They emphasized the importance of allowing plaintiffs like Miss Doe to proceed pseudonymously to protect them from unwanted public attention and potential distractions that might undermine the pursuit of justice. It's troubling how we've become too accustomed to turning people's painful experiences into our entertainment. In response to the legal actions against Combs, many are eagerly anticipating a documentary produced by 50 Cent that's currently in the works. The term surviving X has gained popularity, reminiscent of the morbid lexicon established by the surviving R. Kelly documentary, which shed light on the singer's long history of abusing young girls. Dream Hampton, the producer of the R. Kelly documentary, emphasized in an interview with The New Yorker that the intention was not to create entertainment, but to seek justice for the survivors. The surviving R. Kelly documentary was a powerful tool for justice, providing a platform for the unheard girls-turned-women to share their stories in a collective narrative. Their bravery, however, exposed our collective shame and highlighted the pervasive dismissal they had endured from various segments of the public. Instead of clamoring for televised documentation of someone's sexual trauma as if it's a Shonda Rhimes drama, we should focus on creating a world where survivors feel empowered to come forward without fear. It's about preventing monsters from lingering in the shadows for so long that documentaries become a necessary response. This begins with taking survivors' claims seriously and avoiding distractions fueled by our own biases. The next time sexual misconduct allegations arise against a public figure, let's concentrate on addressing the actual crimes at hand. That's all for the video, folks. Thanks for watching.